This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 28 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and I'm so happy you're joining me here today. Well, many times when we have families who are interested in starting a new morning time habit, they might struggle a little bit with getting everyone on board. And some of the most reluctant characters to morning time might be those boys in your house. So my guest today is Kathy Weitz, and Kathy is the mom of six, five of whom were boys. And we're going to be talking a little bit about how you might entice those boys to join in on morning time. We're going to talk about a ton of great literature selections for boys and girls, and we even discuss things like what to do with the little guys and how to work around the noise and the wiggles. I think you're really going to enjoy today's episode, so let's get right to it. This episode of the Your Morning Basket podcast is brought to you by Maestro Classics. Would you like to bring classical music into your children's lives? You can add classical music to your morning time today with Maestro Classics. These award-winning CDs and MP3s feature storytellers Yadu and Jim Weiss, accompanied by the world-famous London Philharmonic Orchestra. Choose from a dozen titles, including Peter and the Wolf, The Nutcracker, and one of the Barnhill family favorites, The Story of Swan Lake. What makes Maestro Classic CDs so special is that each CD and MP3 contains a 24-page act activity book with illustrations, puzzles, games, and fun facts for kids. You can download free curriculum guides that combine classical music with science, math, geography, and other subjects. All CD and MP3 sets include tracks, which explain to your children how the music was made, who the composer was, the history and story behind the music, the instruments used by the orchestra, and most importantly, how to open your ears and really listen. Listening is a learned art, and Maestro Classics guarantees that these recordings will explain and develop listening skills in your children. Visit maestroclassics.com for free shipping on all CDs and MP3s. They start at just $9.98. As a Your Morning Basket listener, you can receive 17% off your order by using coupon code PAM at checkout. Go to www.maestroclassics.com. That's maestro, spelled M-A-E-S-T-R-O, classics.com, where the best classical music curriculum awaits your homeschool. And now, on with the podcast. Weitz is a mother of six, including five boys, a grandmother, a longtime homeschooler, and the author of the Cottage Press curriculum offerings, which include language arts instruction centered around great literature and seeped in the liberal arts tradition. At her blog, The Reading Mother, Kathy shares about her own pursuit of the life well read, with posts about classic books, poetry, the discipline of keeping a commonplace book, and more. Through The Reading Mother, Kathy hosts the Mother Culture Community, an online group for women wishing to dive into the great books and great ideas of Western civilization for themselves. Kathy has more than two decades under her belt of sharing a daily feast of reading aloud and recitation with her own children. And she joins us today to share a bit about what she has learned along the way, particularly when it comes to doing morning time with boys. Kathy, welcome to the program. Thank you, Pam. I'm glad to be here. Well, although you didn't call it morning time, you have included a daily reading time as part of your routine since your children were very, very young. Can you describe what this time looked like early on and maybe how it's changed over the years? Sure. Well, in the beginning, I had I had my twins, twin boys, and it was five and a half years before their younger brother came along. And so for the first couple of years of homeschooling, I had them and a couple of little infants, and it was pretty easy to do reading time. We called it reading time mostly to do that while baby slept. And then all of a sudden I had four children in seven years, four younger children in seven years, and it got a lot more interesting. So in the beginning with just when it was just Josh and Caleb, my twins, we would sit on the sofa and read and do Bible memory and things like that for really literally hours. 
And apart from that, the only other school we really did on a regular basis was phonics and math. So that was kind of how we were in the beginning. Now, as they got older, of course, we added, you know, a few other things. But then fast forward a few years and I have, you know, a a baby all the way up to 13 year old. (laughs) And, you know, trying to balance all those needs was challenging. And so there were a couple of little different ways that we did things. But there were a few things that pretty much stayed the same. We, We almost always did it first thing in the morning. That was, I mean, right after breakfast and chores. And usually my husband would do devotions before he would leave for work because he didn't have to be at work super early. And then we would, you know, do our chores and get right to our reading time. So that was one thing that was pretty constant through all the years. When I had really little ones, sometimes we had to move to right after lunch or we would do part in the morning and part right after lunch just because we couldn't finish everything and keep everybody happy. So that was basically what we did. But our time always consisted of uh, some kind of memory work, usually scripture, catechism, poem. My children were always memorizing some poem or other. And then we would usually sing a hymn or two if we hadn't done that with dad. And then we would just read aloud. We read literature, we read history, we read science books, we read all kinds of stuff. And then the other thing we would do as the kids got older and they had more things that we needed to memorize, we would add things like Latin chants and phonics drills and math facts and things like that. I tried to group as much as I could during that time, you know, and then obviously I had to work one on one with my kids later in the day. But as much as I could, I tried to group the things that we could group that would be review for my older kids and would help the younger kids learn what they needed to learn as well. Yeah, this is a great message because so often we think about morning time as a time to add on the extra things. And it's really great for that. But I think a lot of times we need to think about morning time as a time to group together those things that kind of need to be done anyway. Yes. And use it to do some of that stuff. And so that's a really good message to send. And so when you say that with your little guys, you were doing math, phonics, and morning time or, you know, your read aloud time, but you were reading a really wide variety of stuff with those boys. You were hitting science and history and picture books and fairy tales and all kinds of things, weren't you? We were. And honestly, there was no other science slash history slash geography curriculum. That was it. That was what we did. Really, aside from what the boys read on their own, mostly interest led, that was our entire humanities curriculum up until probably middle school. Oh, wow. Wow. So this was not something tacked on. This was the main deal. This was our daily feast. It really was the main thing we did. Right. Yeah. I love that so much that you weren't doing this and then going out and trying to do five or six different subjects separate from this. You know, this had a place of importance at the heart of what you were doing. Right. So as your children have gotten older, what fruit have you seen from this practice of read aloud time or morning time? Well, that I could talk about forever. One thing I'll say right up front is I became a better reader. And that, you know, I'm going to start with me because because I think that's an important thing for moms to think about. It not only benefits your kids and it does in great ways, which I'm going to talk about, but it benefits you. You will become a better reader. You may find it a little awkward to read aloud when you first start and hard and you'll trip over the words, but you'll get better and you'll get good and then you'll get really good at it. And then it's fun. It's fun to be really good at something. So that's one thing. The other personal thing that I've gotten out of it is my own education. When I began homeschooling my kids, I had a college degree. I had gone to a reasonably good public school, but my literary education was very poor. I did have an aunt and a cousin who took me aside and took my reading tastes in hand when I was a teenager and helped there greatly. But I was very deficient in history and geography and a lot of those things. And so the reading aloud time taught me and put me in a position where I was ready to take on the classics at a later time, you know, a few years after we began homeschooling. So I'm starting with that just because I want moms to realize this is your education too. Mm Mm-hmm. I always tell everyone that our reading times, our times that we spent reading aloud together were the very best thing that we did. It was the thing that kept us homeschooling, kept me homeschooling. Anytime I would get fed up and know that I was doing a terrible job 
and sure that my children were going to turn out to be, you know, psychiatric messes because I was such a mess, I would consider the fact that I would not be able to read for several hours a day to my children. And those thoughts went right back on the shelf. So it was a sanity keeper for me in a way. Another thing, just to think about all those years, I mean, this is a lot of years I've read aloud to my children. I'm still reading aloud to my 16-year-old. Little Drops of Water, Little Grains of Sand. That was one of the first poems my kids ever memorized. Really and truly makes the mighty ocean and the sand. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing how this little tiny investment adds up. You have a shared culture with your children. You have quotes. You have characters. You have things that happen during reading time that you still tell family stories about. We had a beautiful red fox and a blue heron that would show up in our backyard almost every day when we were reading aloud. We still talk about that. The year that I was reading Little House to my kids and we were reading about Laura's first four years of marriage and how she made rhubarb pie and left the sugar out. (laughs) Actually, my husband was reading that. I actually made pumpkin pie and did not do this on purpose, but I left the sugar out. Pumpkin pie without sugar is not good. Yeah, I would imagine that it's not. (laughs) And also with The Long Winter, we read that. My husband read that aloud to the kids in 1997. That year, as he was reading it, we got 42 inches of snow in Virginia, which is not normal. He read it aloud again in 2010. We got 48 inches of snow while he was reading it aloud. Now that's a banned book. We don't read that book in our house anymore. (laughs) I bet you don't. I bet you don't. We have so many little stories like that. Another real beautiful benefit for homeschool moms who have a lot of children is that as you're reading to your older kids, as you're doing memory work with your older kids, you are previewing for your younger kids what's coming up. And they learn, they, it's amazing how much they actually pick up and remember of things that you think are over their heads. So you're making your load late, the work you're going to have to do later, you're making it lighter. Right, right. Because they're getting a taste of it ahead of time. That's right. And it really is amazing how much those little brains will soak up and you don't even realize that they're doing it. That is so true. That is so true. Another thing, Pam, is it freed up our day. If we did not get anything done that day besides our reading time, it was okay. I never really worried about it. It also meant that we weren't doing school all day long because we were grouping so many things together. My kids spent tons and tons of hours outside playing because we were finished. And that gave me time to read, to do stuff in the house, you know, to just have a little bit more sanity time too. So that was a big benefit for me, for all of us, really. So it sounds like you weren't doing a lot of busy work. And did you find that their retention and understanding was really good, despite the fact that they probably were just listening to you read And were you having them narrate? Was there some kind of processing that you were doing or were they just listening to you read and maybe having discussion? Was it enough? We did do quite a bit of narration, probably not as much as we should have looking back. And when I listen to to podcasts and presentations on narration, I think, oh, I wish I'd done more. But honestly, I think it was enough. They, you know what the interesting thing was, we would discuss what we'd read. And we did sometimes discuss it at dinner with dad, not all the time. But what I noticed is that whatever we read that day, my kids played later in the day Mm. over and over and over again. I saw how their imaginations were formed by what we'd read. So they were reviewing it and rehearsing it, just not necessarily in a schoolish way. They were reviewing it and rehearsing it with one another. And if you told them that they were doing school, they would have stopped. <laughs> and so you were sure not to tell them that. <laughs> I never told them that. I never let on what they were actually doing. You know, one more thing I do want to say about the fruit. I mean, there's still, I could probably name 10 more things, but this is really important for, and because I have language arts curriculum, you know that this is important to me, but they really did not need tons of prompting when it came to writing. They knew the kinds of things to say. They knew how sentences should be put together. 
They had really beautiful patterns of speech, even their talking, when talking with one another, I would hear it come out. But when they sat down to write, between the copy work that we did and the reading aloud, they understood how English worked and how it was supposed to sound. We did do extensive grammar study when they got older, but they understood how English was supposed to sound. And that was the fruit of all of that reading aloud that you did to them, those language patterns being ingrained into their minds. I think so. And I think, you know, because it was in all of my kids and they all have different abilities, you know, in different levels that they do things. So it was across the board with all of them, even with their different learning styles and their different ways of doing things. Right, right. Well, some people might predict that it would be more difficult to draw boys into the humanities with subjects like poetry and art appreciation. In your experience, is this accurate? Yes and no. I mean, I think it can be. If you start doing this early enough, they're not going to know any better. They're not going to know they're not supposed to like it. So that's one thing. But if you didn't and let's say, you know, you have a 10 year old and you're just starting now and he's already decided he doesn't like this stuff. It's for girls. Then I think you kind of just have to be humorous about it, you know, be see the see the humor in it, but persevere and just say, you know, this is what we're going to do. (laughs) And I think eventually they will come around. My boys did not push back against reading time. You know, all of them wanted to go play. They were very interested in getting outside and playing football or, you know, building forts or doing whatever it was they were going to do that day. But they really valued and treasured our reading time as well. And honestly, the classic books that we read, because they had lots of action and battle and all those kinds of things in them, and most of the best children's books really are like that, I think they're naturally suited to boys especially the, you know, classic children's stories and classic stories retold for children if they're well done. Well, let's talk about this for a few minutes. If I am sitting here and I'm staring at this 10-year-old across the table from me and he's kind of rolling his eyes at me, are there some particular works that you found your boys more drawn to um, over the years? Well, yes. I mean, definitely. We just read a lot of children's classics, but think about some of the children's classics. Of course, you know, we read Little House, Narnia, Little Britches. Little Britches, that's a boy book. Right. My boys love that book. Even for a little guy, the Thornton Burgess, like Peter Cottontail, Mother West Wind, Chatterer the Red Squirrel, all those books, they're very, they're friendly to both boys and girls, I think. Fairy tales. Now, fairy tales can be very princessy, but there are plenty with lots of action and battles. And battles seem to be a good thing that boys like. And lots of good literature has that action adventure kind of feel, you know, think of Treasure Island or Kidnapped, books like that. And then, you know, even some more modern books like Where the Red Fern Grows, which is a book about a boy and a dog. Well, what about boys in poetry, Kathy? How should we approach the task of choosing poems, whether for memorization or recitation or just reading and sharing aloud? Are there certain styles, subjects or themes that tend to appeal more to boys? Well, I polled my boys. I sent them a Facebook message last night in our Facebook family group and said, guys, help out. So here's what they told me. Every boy must memorize Jabberwocky. That was unanimous. We had a poem, a little book by Gillette Burgess. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's kind of an older kind of humor writer. And he wrote a poem called The Goops. Oh, yes. The Goops, they lick their fingers. My kids love that poem. And he also wrote a couple of other funny poems that they memorize. So humorous poems, I think, are good. And also, again, action poems. Robert Burns' March to Bannockburn. My boys adore that poem. As a matter of fact, my 16-year-old is going to be reciting that for our Scully group in a couple of weeks. So I don't think I can get him to do the Scottish accent, but... (laughs) It would be cool. Yeah, it would be cool. Old Ironsides is one that one of my boys mentioned. And, And I will say... They all said, but no Emily Dickinson, mom, which we have this running feud about Emily Dickinson because I really love her. And they are all totally offended that she uses slant rhymes. And the the rhyme that you expect doesn't show up in most of her poems every now and then. But I told them that it's okay. I won anyway, because they know what a slant rhyme is. They know who Emily Dickinson is. They've memorized a good bit of her poetry, like a book and autumn. And, you know, so 
I look at it as an overall win. <laughs> yeah, despite the fact that they don't necessarily want to recommend her for boys, they really do have a good familiarity with her. They do. They do. Now, did you show them the trick where they can sing any Emily Dickinson poem to the tune <laughs> of Yellow Rose of Texas? Because that probably would have won them over. Or Gilligan's Island or, yeah. <laughs> or Amazing Grace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you did that once or twice. Okay, well, I love those suggestions, and those are actually some of our favorites as well. So you really think that humor is one of the really big themes that would appeal mostly to boys. And then once again, going back to that excitement and adventure and hero stories. You know, we were talking about literature earlier, and I lost my train of thought. A lot of times in children's literature, there are heroes, and I think heroes really do appeal to boys. What do you think about that? They do. I mean, they appeal to all of us, really, because the hero of heroes is Jesus. And we're attracted to that. And so I think definitely all of us are attracted to heroes. But boys identify in a special way with heroes, I think. And that's what I saw in my boys in the way that they were, you know, enamored of certain heroes that we read about. Well, thinking back, you told me at one point you had like a 13-year-old down to a newborn. And then knowing that you had so many boys, a large number of those little bitty kids had to have been boys. So what wisdom can you share with a mom who's struggling to keep morning time going with a bunch of little boys who are maybe a bit noisy and wiggly and even interrupting to the point of just total distraction and frustration for the mother? Right. I had those days. So anything that I'm saying here, I probably learn mostly by my failures, little drops of water, little grains of sand. Even if you only get a little bit in each day for a season, it's okay. Also, the principle of short lessons can be helpful. We definitely had two sessions a day when we had a lot of little ones and we took advantage of nap time for reading. I'm a fan of play pens and I'm a fan of baby gates and we use those. There were times when I would, I made little tapes for my little ones with me reciting poems and catechism questions and phonics rules and all kinds of random things. My husband and I both did. And I would put the little ones in their bedrooms in a safe place, in a playpen or in their cribs with the tape going, not to sleep, but to listen. And then I would take that time to read with my older kids. So there were lots of creative ways like that, that I managed And there were a lot of days when it was horrible. It was just not good. And we put it all away and did something else. Now, I'm assuming that as you were reading to this audience of boys, they were not sitting perfectly still on their hands. (laughs) My boys still don't sit perfect. None of them. (laughs) I have 28 year olds who don't sit still. No, actually, they're 29. Okay. Work with the wiggle. I forget who I co-opted that from some homeschool guru. I don't remember who it was, but work with the wiggle. I think it might have been. Anyway, I don't remember who it was, but you can't expect them to sit perfectly still while you're reading or they need to move. And that's a good thing. And you have to see that as they're not trying to irritate you. They're just doing what they do. But on the other hand, they do need to learn to sit quietly. Sometimes I found that Because we've always, we had our kids with us in church most of the time. Those two things kind of reinforced each other. They learned to sit still for a sermon at a relatively young age. I mean, it was always a learning process and there was always battles that went on to make it happen. But that would reinforce the reading time and the reading time would reinforce the being able to sit still for a sermon. So I think it's kind of important that you work on it, but that you don't expect perfection really ever. Right. So maybe starting with a very small amount of time and trying to grow that time as they get a little older. Yeah. I used to tell my kids when we would do reading time and they would find 40 different ways to mount a sofa. You know, they would have legs up in the air. They'd have legs over the edge. They whatever. We just had rules about not touching each other pretty much. But, you know, however they wanted to sit, however they wanted their head dangling or their feet dangling, I didn't worry too much about. Another thing that I did as they got a little older and I had, say, you know, toddlers and up, I would allow quiet toys. So if they could play quietly with Legos or play quietly with Playmobil without grabbing their brothers, 
Playmobil or <laughs> Legos. You know, if they could do those things quietly, play with their little cars, I would allow that. They couldn't make noises, you know, but they could. They were allowed to, to have things in their hands. And then the other thing we did when they got even a little bit older was I gave them each a sketchbook. I'd write the date and the books we were reading and the poems we were reading. And then I would give them a two-page sketchbook spread and say, okay, you can draw anything you want on these two pages. And I gave them Prismacolors, and they would color. And and actually, those are kind of precious keepsakes now. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Now, were they drawing what things that you were reading about, or were they just allowed to draw anything? The little ones could draw anything. The big ones I made, you know, when I did that, I would allow my elementary age kids to do it as well. And so they were required to draw something that we were reading about. Okay. Okay. So this was kind of a a narration based on what you were reading. Yeah, it really was. Well, you said, Kathy, that, you know, your boys started young with this and they did it all the way up through school. Did you ever kind of hit a wall with any of your boys? And we won't tell which one it was if you did. (laughs) Maybe in their teen years where they were just completely resistant to participating in this activity. When my older boys were in high school, you know, then I had this huge age span. I did enroll my older children in online classes for great books. And they had so much reading to do for that, that I had to excuse them from a large part of our morning time. They usually had to stay around for at least the memory work or maybe one short thing that we would read. It's certainly poetry. We always read poetry together. But then they would go off to do their own thing. But what I would find is they would kind of sneak back in. So they would pick something that they needed to do that they didn't have to think too hard about, like making Latin flashcards or doing some kind of math review. And they'd sit at the kitchen table while I was in the living room with the younger siblings, if it was something they wanted to listen to. But I did, you know, obviously it was just too much to ask them to do all that they needed to do for high school and also sit in on our, you know, prolonged reading times. But apart from that, I, you know, there were times when they would rather have been doing something else. And there were times when, you know, I got angry about it. But overall, it was just sort of what we did. And because we had done it for so long, they didn't really think about objecting too much. What was it that made you really push through against any resistance that you met? I'm pretty hard headed. I knew the value. I could see the value. I mean, I started really seeing, especially the language arts value of it. So there was that practical part that I knew was really important. That was one thing. And just cherishing the family time made me say, this is important and it's something we're going to do as a family. And I knew the years were flying by, you know, when I had these 15 year olds and babies at the same time, or, you know, toddlers, I realized this is going to be over in the blink of an eye. Well, you talked about all of the different classics that you guys have read together as a family and how it really has shaped your family culture. Are there ways in which exposure to the classics in a group or a family setting such as morning time is more conducive to the formation of virtue than, say, if I just assigned my child to read something on their own? I think so, because I think it gives you, again, that common culture, the common language to talk about things. And we certainly did that. I will say, and just one thing that I gleaned early on from Charlotte Mason is, you know, she had a real dislike for what she called moralizing. She didn't like moralistic stories. So in other words, she would say, tell the story and get out of the way and let the story do its magic. And so we didn't really do separate virtue or character training, but I saw my kids applying lessons that they had learned from different characters that we read about. And the other thing I would say about that is, as a family, in addition to reading time, we went to church and we sat under the preaching of God's word. So they already knew what virtue looked like because they knew what Jesus looked like. They knew the hero of heroes. But we didn't have extended discussions trying to show exactly how Achilles was like and unlike Jesus. You know, we didn't do that kind of thing. It was more that those conversations would come up naturally at dinner. You know, you'd talk about the rage of Achilles kind of in an incidental way almost, or the, you would talk about Odysseus's trickery, things like that in kind of an incidental way, not necessarily strictly saying, okay, now we're going to talk about virtue and character. So these weren't object lessons you were presenting. You really 
the literature really spoke for itself. And because I love the way you put that, because they knew the hero of heroes and because you sat under those church teachings, they really did know right from wrong as they were exposed to right and wrong and heroes, flawed heroes in these stories. They really could pick out the good and the bad because they had come to that virtue earlier. Yes, that's right. And you, you want to trust them to do that. You know, you, you want to trust the and that's the classics are so great for that because they're so filled with those kind of obvious lessons, you know, that you don't even have to point out and that nobody has to say this is good. This is bad because it's it's clear. Right. It's very clear. And so when I guess that just goes back to making sure that you're dealing with young kids with a very clear black and white, right and wrong kinds of thing, and then wait until that's really established in them before you get into those grayer areas as they get older. I suppose I wouldn't say that I consciously did that. Literature that appeals to younger children probably is more black and white. So taking those things into consideration is definitely definitely worthwhile. Yeah, when I had a bunch of little children, we weren't necessarily reading the actual Iliad or Odyssey aloud because I couldn't. I just didn't have time. I have done that now with my youngest boys. We read the classics. That's what we read aloud now. We read the Iliad and the Odyssey and Virgil and we're read, I'm reading Dante right now with my 16-year-old. So, yes, I suppose that's true that, you know, most of what we read in the earlier years was more black and white. And so, yeah, that's right. It seems like kind of almost like a perfect, you know, I haven't really given a whole lot of thought until we started having this conversation. But, you know, you said the things that appeal to children are things that are black and white. So it's almost like it was designed that way that what appeals to them are the things that they can grapple with and understand at the level they can grapple with and understand it. Right. You know, right. and so the grayer things don't appeal to them. And maybe there's a reason for that. Right. One other little thing that Dr. Perrin said last night in the, a little meeting I was in for Scully groups was he talked about the idea of loving something before you criticize it. And I was kind of thinking about that today as I was thinking about this idea of virtue formation. I think what we want to do, like, for example, the retellings for younger children of the Greek epics, the children's Homer by Patrick Column, doesn't get too much into some of the more gray areas like you talked about. But it does teach you to love some of those characters. You can't help but love Hector. You can't help but love of Odysseus, you know, and Penelope, who was a terrific hero. So you love them. And then when you come to them again, when you come to them, when you meet them in high school, you might be a little bit more ready to be a little more critical. But I think it is important that our children have a love for the characters, even the flawed characters, you know, and don't be too quick to rush to judgment, but to see the fallenness of man in some of those things and be empathetic. That's another thing that literature does for us. It makes us empathetic instead of being judgmental because that's a virtue also. Yeah, that's very true. And I love that loving before you become critical. So it almost goes back to that Charlotte Mason idea of synthesis before analysis where, yeah, yeah you kind of take in the whole picture and you really, we really didn't mean for this discussion to, to be a, you know, oh, do we read adaptations before we read the classics, but I really love where that's gone. It's given me something to chew on and think about as to whether or not maybe we should read those adaptations before we read the actual classics. It's not such a bad thing. I think there are some that are definitely worth reading. I would be careful because there are some very poor retellings and you do, but there, you know, there's a handful that are just great and you can count on. You can count on Padraig Column. You can count on the Delaires for their Greek myths. You can count on James Baldwin's retellings for younger children. You can count on Alfred Church. His retellings are good. But, you know, what do these all have in common? They were all written before 1950. <laughs> There's something <laughs> about that 1950 time slot. I don't know. That's just where everything went wrong. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but there really was this kind of golden age of children's literature, and a lot of it did happen before that point. Yes. Yeah. So 
you know, seek those out. I do think it's worth being familiar with the stories. It's going to make things go a lot easier for your kids when they get to high school and read the classics. Also, I will say this, you know, as someone, I mentioned that my education happened as I was educating my children. To this day, when there's a history subject that I don't know much about, when there's a classic that I have never read before, my first, my default will be, is there a good children's author that's handled it? And I will read that first. I will read the story in history first so that I have a mental picture and hooks to hang the big picture on, you know, when I'm working with a a book that may be a little more difficult to read. Yeah, yeah. I never tackle a new Shakespeare play that I haven't read before without at first reading, you know, some kind of really good synopsis of it, you know, and the ones written for children are usually really, really good. So, right. Yeah, yeah. they are. So the very least you can know who everyone is. Right, (laughs) right. That's helpful. Well, in your experience, let's kind of go through little boys up through the ages. And let's start with really little boys first. What were some of your favorite read alouds? Or I don't know, maybe you asked your boys this for little boys. Okay, little boys, same as little girls. Little House, Narnia. There's none of these are going to be a surprise. I mentioned Little Britches and Thornton Burgess. Oh, George McDonald's, Princess and Curdy, Princess and Goblin. The kids loved those, and so did I. Aesop's Fables. The My Book House anthologies are excellent. Also, history stories like James Baldwin. I mentioned those 50 Famous Stories is wonderful. And then he's got a couple others in that same series. Picturesque Tale of Progress, which is out of print, but oh, so wonderful. Worth getting, worth paying the 80 bucks or whatever it is to get the whole set. Those are some of our favorites. Middle age boys. And when I say middle age, I don't mean 40. I mean (laughs) middle school age. (laughs) Well, they better be good for 42. Remember what Lewis said, no book is worth reading at 10 if it's not equally worth rereading at 50. Very true. Pinocchio, Wind in the Willows, Treasure Island, Kidnapped, The Hobbit, Robin Hood, The Bronze Bow. That was one that several of my kids mentioned. They loved The Bronze Bow. Also, there's a whole series of books called Living History Books. I don't know if you're familiar with them. But they are wonderful. They're also pre-1950, I think, all of them. There's Rolf and the Viking Bow and the Red Keep. And there's a whole bunch. There's like seven or eight of them. Exodus Books has those. They're really good. Hollings, Sea Hollings books. Those are kind of, you know, they're more like science, geography books. But those are really, really fun to read aloud. Okay. And then what about for the teenagers? Well, basically, then you just get into, I think, just reading the classics. Pilgrim's Progress, and we read it in the King James English. And that was actually starting in my elementary school kids. I read that to them. The Odyssey in seventh or eighth grade, the Iliad, the Aeneid, Plutarch, Shakespeare, of course, Dickens. We, uh, My specific ones the boys mentioned were David Copperfield, Great Expectations, and A Christmas Carol. Of course, everyone loves that. History. There were some history books, too. Dorothy Mills history books. I think Memoria Press sells those. Those Mm -hmm. are really good. We read King Arthur in Old English, not Old English, but, you know, King James type English, which it was written by Sir James Nowells and it was adapted from Mallory's Mort. That was really good. And the kids mentioned that one, too, that they really liked that as middle school and teenagers. And then we did read some. uh, We read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy last year. And as I mentioned, I'm reading The Divine Comedy with my 16-year-old. And I will also say that today I picked up and I am reading to him The Wind in the Willows because he's at that stage, he's a history buff, and he's kind of in a surly, just the facts man stage. And so I decided he needed a little fiction in his life. (laughs) So moms get to decide those things. Well, he's happy with it. Let me ask you a question that really we hadn't talked about before, but has kind of come up through this. So if I am a mom and I have a 10 or 11 year old, even a house full of children where maybe, you know, they're in an older elementary age range and I've never read this kind of literature to them before. So they're a little older than the whole little house thing, but even something like Pinocchio and Wind in the Willows to a child who is not used to that kind of language, the level of language, the structure of language like that, it can be a little daunting to try to read that to a child. Do you have any tips for how to start introducing 
those uh, more complex and even archaic language patterns to an older elementary kid who's really been fed on a diet of, you know, not such complex language patterns. I would start with some shorter stories like the James Baldwin 50 famous stories. Get them familiar with some of the characters they're going to come across. The Dallaire Greek myths and the Norse myths. Those are, you know, they're written at a, at a lower level, but they're still very engaging. They're still very interesting. And I would give them little doses of the harder stuff. Start reading King James Bible. That's one way to really, because they'll especially read familiar passages from the King James passages that they might be familiar with in another translation, you know, a more modern translation. That's one thing you can do and have them memorize it. That will help to start get the, getting those language patterns into their heads. And again, reading those adaptation or the retellings, I actually, I, I call them retellings, not, not so much adaptations, because they really are retellings of the stories. And they try to imitate certain features of the actual stories. But so, you know, read Patrick Collum's Children's Homer or something like that. It's just a little bit easier than the actual, you know, poem itself. Right, right. Okay, so I love those ideas. So start with stories that they're familiar with, but read them in a new language, like with the King James Version. And you also mentioned earlier that moms, when they start out reading, read aloud okay, but they get better at it. So is there a place in a situation like this for maybe audiobooks with a professional narrator to help, might help everybody understand a little better? Well, we certainly did a lot of that. We mostly did it in the car. And I think that's a great alternative. But it's going to slow down mom learning to read. That's true. So you got to balance those two things. That's true. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and just you've been a wealth of information. And I think moms of boys and girls are really going to enjoy the podcast. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yes, you can find me at thereadingmother.net. That's my personal blog. And my curriculum publishing company is cottagepress.net. And there you offer literature selections for elementary all the way through high school? Right. It's language arts, mostly. There are links to literature selections there, but, but my curriculum there is language arts. It's a kind of a complete language arts program that includes the literature, grammar, literature analysis, poetry. It's all, all mixed in. Writing and everything. And composition, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Well, we really appreciate you coming on to chat with us today. Thank you so much, Pam. And there you have it. Now for today's basket bonus, we have pulled all of Kathy's great recommendations of books for you and made you a printable library list. You can print this out, stick it in the front of your morning time binder or take it with you to the library and check off those wonderful books as you read them with your family. Some of those books that your boys and girls might be interested in. And you can find that at the show notes for this episode. That is at pambarnhill.com forward slash YMB28. We link to all of those books there for you, as well as the other resources that Kathy and I talked about. And you can download the printable book list there. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks with another great podcast interview. If you would like to leave a rating or review for the Your Morning Basket podcast, we show you how to do that on the show notes as well. We give you a little link to the podcast page that you can follow to leave us a review. We really appreciate when you do that because it helps us get word out about the podcast to new listeners. So we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. And until then, keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day. 